Hey everyone, this is Chris. And this is Julia, and this is episode number 46 of the Mixology Talk podcast. Now, we've talked about the history of cocktail ingredients before. We talked about some pretty fascinating histories of different liqueurs, of different spirits, and it seemed like folks enjoyed those episodes. I know I did. We talked about one of my favorites, Green Chartreuse. Gotta we talked love it. about Drambui. There was a lot of cool things that we talked about, in my humble opinion, of course. <laughs> I think you're in good company here. I hope so. So recently, a listener actually asked us to look into the history of some of the equipment that we use behind the bar. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing today. And I'm going to go ahead and admit this. I did a lot of research for this in the past. But to be completely honest, I forgot a lot more than I remember. <laughs> so uh, Yeah, we did a little bit of digging, but the, it's actually hard, pretty hard to find some of the history about these bar tools. So we're going to do our best, but I would absolutely love it if you know more than we say. Let us know in the comments over at mixologytalk.com slash 46. Yeah, so the very first piece of equipment that we're going to talk about is probably one of the most utilized behind the bar these days, and that is the cocktail shaker. Definitely the most well-known. Known, I think. Mm -hmm. And since you asked, which you didn't, the concept of shaking liquids to combine them is pretty ancient. I mean, let's let's be honest. That's a pretty rudimentary way to mix things together. But when I looked into it, there is evidence that goes as far back as 7000 BC in pre-Hispanic Mexico and South America, where they would take gourds, hollow them out and fill them with tequila and agave nectar and lime juice. Sorry, no. <laughs> Damn. They would thought I had that one. Well, I think I think they'd be very pleased to learn that recipe. <laughs> <laughs> but instead they would they would take this hollowed out gourd and they would make a frothy drink with cacao. Ah, interesting. Very cool. Yeah, so uh, I'm thinking about maybe starting a new line of organic non GMO cocktail shakers. And let me guess, what are you gonna use in them? Gourds. Uh, yeah. Okay. Make them out of that's gourds. That's going to happen, guys. So, uh, yeah, definitely wait for that one. <laughs> I think that's got to be a Kickstarter for <laughs> sure. But, yeah, it had its roots in... It's a pretty rudimentary shaker that we see way back in the day, 7,000 BC. And the cocktail shaker has evolved a lot since then, even up to the late 1800s, where we start to see what is pretty close to the cocktail shaker that we know today. This is the story that I could find. The rumor has it in the late 1800s, there was an innkeeper who was pouring liquid back and forth between two containers in order to mix them together. Yeah, actually, there is a technique called throwing a drink. I think it's called throwing a drink. I know how to do that. <laughs> right. Not, not <laughs> at a wall or at a person. <laughs> oh. But between two containers. And it's a pretty elaborate show. And people can get really good at it. I remember seeing a video of somebody... In, I think it was the Philippines doing this, and it incorporates a lot of body movement spinning around and the liquid itself kind of following a different path as you spin. It's pretty cool. I, I just, I don't think the innkeeper was doing that. Uh, he may have. This is, uh, <laughs> this is, he it's may entirely... have watched that same YouTube video back in the 1800s. You know, I heard that YouTube was really in Been around back a while. Then. It's yeah. kind of a big deal. Exactly. So, <laughs> so this innkeeper was making a drink by mixing things together, pouring the liquid back and forth. Apparently he looked down at his two containers and noticed that one of them was smaller than the other. He stuck one inside the other and shook them for, quote unquote, a bit of a show. Hmm. I wonder how much he had to drink that night. Yeah, really? <laughs> well, the rest is history. And actually, I would argue that if you look back on this story, if it is true, then he actually shook the drink as a show, meaning that shaking any cocktail at all is actually flair. Ah. Yeah, ah, you see what I did there. Nice, I like it's it. Like, it's like flair before it was flair. I know, it's like hipster Hip flair. Hipster flair. <laughs> <laughs> But cocktails evolved, or cocktail shakers evolved a lot since then, and they took all kinds of shapes and sizes, even up till the 40s, where they were a sign of a really sophisticated household and a symbol of basically kind of the good life. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, you sort of have the James Bond persona a little bit, although I think that came a little bit later. The sense of okay, the cocktail shaker was a symbol of sort of high society and things like that. Yeah, there was actually a TV show called The Thin Man, which really kind of celebrated cocktails. It was about a private eye and a lady that was from a pretty well-to-do family, and it was about their adventures together and it always had a cocktail or martini involved in the episode that makes when sense he would return home sh there would be cocktail hour basically so i think that kind of evolved through society and yeah. became a thing well in the uh, early mid 40s of course everything changed with the beginning of world war ii 
unfortunately at the time cocktail shakers were all made of metal and when you're in wartime using metal on things like cocktail shakers it's not exactly shined upon yeah i think there were better uses for metal back then um, artillery shells bullets right and actually helmets. that's that's exactly what happened a lot of the companies that were making cocktail shakers switched over their lines and started making war materials like things like artillery absolutely and then after world war ii we start to see the kind of movement away from shakers and much more into modern appliances. So here we start to see shakers being replaced by electric blenders. Yeah, this was like the decade where you see all those goofy ads where the the 50s housewife is pressing buttons on a giant Cuisinart machine. That's what I always think of when I think of the 50s. Oh, one of my favorites was like somebody standing on like what looks like a treadmill and they have a belt around their waist and they start jiggling. What are you? Oh, man. Oh, um, I have no have idea. We're going to have a lot of Chris links to videos in about. our uh, podcast. Uh, I don't know if we want to include that uh, one. Probably we'll not. See. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the moral of the story is in the 50s, electrical appliances definitely started to become available to everyone. And the electric blender was no exception. So what you started to see at this point was the advent of the blended drink. And it made its way into everyone's house. Yeah, and there was a kind of a dark period in cocktails. Well, there was a couple of bright spots in it, but um, we started to see the cocktail movement really starting to gain traction again in the late 90s up to kind of where we're at now. And I will definitely say that we're going through this second golden age. It's kind of a renaissance. It. It's kind of, kind of a grandiose title, but basically a lot of care and a lot of attention, a lot of our artistic ability is being poured into cocktails these days. Poured? Which is, into cocktails. Literally poured. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, I think that th while there was a little bit of a gap there in history, we couldn't find much history of the cocktail shaker between the 50s and the 90s. But um, looking back on what was happening in the cocktail scene, I can't say I'm terribly surprised. Right. And I'm sure there were a lot of shakers back then. Anyways, the next piece of equipment that we're going to take a look at is one of my favorites, and that is the cocktail strainer. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you a question here that I'm sure you know the answer to. There's two common types of cocktail strainers, the julep and the hawthorn. Which yes. one do you think came first? Uh, definitely the julep strainer. Yeah, that's kind of an easy question. Yeah. If you actually just look at them, it makes sense. The julep strainer, um, just to describe, it's kind of a big flat spoon with holes in it, really. Yeah, it kind of looks like a giant serving spoon that is yeah. a little bit more rounded out, and then it has perforated holes through it. So uh, the manufacturing process would be way, way simpler. Oh, super simple, right. And not only that, but actually back in the day, and by back in the day, I mean the 1800s when you start to see the julep strainer come about, they really resembled some specialized spoons of the era. So they weren't their own unique thing. They were actually fairly common. And actually, in some cases, they resembled a tea caddy as well. Ah, nice. Um, yeah, and I actually, over the years, have figured out that if you do a lot of sugar or salt rims, like in margaritas or lemon drops, uh, some of the liquid can collect inside of the wherever you hold that salt or sugar. And the julep strainer is a great way, kind of like a colander, to sift through some of those big chunks, something I've used in the past, some of the bars I've worked with. This is going to sound terrible, but it's just like cleaning kitty litter. It's exactly you're just like uh, you're just Kitty sifting litter. out the clumps. Exactly. <laughs> There's no difference at all. So that's another way that you could use your julep strainer. I don't recommend it. That's pretty <laughs> oh, that's gross. That's terrible. That's horrible. <laughs> so but nobody's it... really sure. I'm going to just get right back into it. Oh, my God. I don't want to go down that road. So nobody's really sure how a julep strainer was to be used with a mint julep. There are a couple of theories, though. One of them is to keep the mint and the ice away from people's teeth. Yeah, so they were actually served to the guest, and the guest would hold the strainer and, and hold back the crushed ice from falling in their face, which I don't know about you, but I just I just can't stand it when I get mint and ice in my mustache. Yeah, no, it's terrible. It's just rough. It's so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, heard another theory that there was a medical term called, quote unquote, julep, which refers to, quote, a mixture containing no solids, quote. That would certainly explain it, although it seems a little bit far fetched. Yeah, well, maybe they had a julep and then they adapted it to medical usage uh, something like that i don't know about that <laughs> but yeah we can definitely see the evolution pattern happening from a julep into a hawthorne strainer which is 
the more modern version of a strainer. Yeah, um, in 1889, uh, we see the first evidence of a patent that appears, it, it appears to refer to a julep strainer that's had a spring added and holes in the middle. So this, in my mind, like it becomes a Hawthorne strainer when a spring is added. That's like the thing. Yeah, definitely. And that is pretty much what we know as a cocktail strainer up to now. I mean, it's a name that's kind of the the big purpose of it. And that's what most people identify with a cocktail strainer is yeah, when the you, Hawthorne strainer. Yeah, when you think about the word cocktail strainer, you're, not, you're probably not thinking of a julep, let's be honest. Yeah, if you were just to choose one of these strainers, definitely want to choose a Hawthorne strainer. It's a much more utilitarian kind of piece of equipment behind the bar. The julep strainer is always a nice touch, but you can accomplish a lot of the same things with a Hawthorne strainer. And I don't think most people need more than one strainer, so it makes a lot of sense. Mm, I beg to differ. Most people. (laughs) Not cocktail nerds like us. Right. So I did some digging, but I just could not figure out the origin of the name Hawthorne. I know most people out in the real world call it just a cocktail strainer, but we in the nerd circle know that it's actually called a Hawthorne, and I could not figure out why. I, I It wasn't the name of the company that made them. It didn't seem like it was the name of a hotel or bar where it was used, and I couldn't find any evidence of a bartender named Hawthorne who used it either. So if anybody out there knows the origin of this term, I'm, I would. I'm actually just really stinking curious. So you know, actually, I would like to ask everyone. Please, if you know the answer, please contribute and you know, uh, yeah, send let your us know. Comments into mixologytalk.com/slash forty six. Or if you want to make up a really great story, which is usually what I do, yeah, just make something up. Contribute to that as totally. well because that would be equally as amazing. You know, as long as you own it, that's really all we do on this podcast. So ah, just own it. You'd probably be fine. Right, exactly. Yeah. I'll go ahead and update the Wikipedia entry and then nobody's going to know. It will become history from It'll here, become history. From this point on. It's yeah. true. <laughs> you could be a part of history. So I hope you enjoyed this topic. We had a little bit of fun with it, but I found it really interesting. I learned a lot while uh, doing the research for this topic, and hopefully we uh, did a good job of explaining. Yeah, no, I remember you saying that we're going to be doing a couple of posts on other pieces of equipment and the history of that in the near future as well, right? Yeah, so coming soon, it probably won't be posted by the time this podcast is up, but coming soon, we're going to be doing a series of blog posts about this very topic. And we're going to talk about uh, shakers and strainers as well, but hopefully go into a bit more detail. And this is part of the reason why I'm hoping someone can tell me where the word Hawthorne came from. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or make up a good story. Or make up a good story, exactly. Um, But we're also going to do some posts about other types of cocktail equipment. So definitely stay tuned. And if you're listening far in the future, go ahead and head over to mixologytalk.com slash 46 and we'll include a link. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. And one last thing, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record here. But if you could leave us a review on iTunes, it would definitely do a lot of good for us. Yeah. Um, So leave a five-star, yeah, just pretty much a five-star review on iTunes. Yeah, it helps other people find this podcast, and it helps us get into more earbuds. We would definitely appreciate it. So um, until next time, cheers, everyone. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.